or anything. Great. Well, it's really great to be with you this morning. And um, yeah, in start, starting this morning, I would just like to share some words more of testimony. Um, as you're aware, Mary and I, we took a trip recently back to our field of service in northern Iraq. And um, part of the time was to visit people that we had been working among. And part of the time was to attend uh, a conference in some ways, a, a conference of different workers who are working among the Kurds. And um, if you remember rightly, and I can just share it with you briefly, the Kurds are about a population of 40 million working, uh, they're living in the sort of um, north of Syria, the southeast of Turkey, into northern Iraq, into western Iran, into southern Russia and the Caucasus region, and also about 2 million Kurds spread around the world who have left their homeland, and they're living here and there. So a total of 40 million. And uh, we were serving there for 22 years. And going back now has been a real privilege, so one and a half years after we left the field, to see how the Lord is still at work. And um, what was really exciting is meeting some of the people that we had worked with and seeing the passion of their heart still for knowing the Lord and for serving the Lord. Uh, a lot of these people you have been praying for down the years, um, young men, getting on a bit older now, um, who have stepped into ministry, have stepped into church leadership, and you have been those who have been praying for them. Uh, families who are ongoing in their love for the Lord and wanting to serve the Lord. And... Um, Again, these are people that you've been praying for. And then also at the conference itself, some wonderful testimonies of how God is at work. In a sense, touching into the life of this person or that person or this population and that population and seeing that the Lord is truly at work among the Kurds in this day. I mean, even numbers that we've not heard of before, um, for example, into Western Iran, where, of course, we're aware that God is doing something, but one person would say, well, actually, I believe there's about 5,000 believers in that region, uh, divided among 300 house groups or house churches. Or in Lebanon these days, uh, where many Syrian Kurds have run as uh, refugees, have gone into Lebanon, and the churches went and helped them. And they're saying there's about 10,000 people who are being touched regularly by Christian witness and by the gospel. Some have become Christians and others are on the way to becoming Christians. But it was exciting to hear that, again, all these people are being touched by the gospel and are excited getting to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In our own city, um, one young pastor taking the gospel forward, going to the local book fair, and often there's like Islamic groups who have also got their tables at the book fair, but they're being courageous to share the gospel and to uh, sell books, sell Bibles, and many other ways that the gospel is going forward into that region. And so <clears throat> we've come back excited, of course, by the fact that that is happening. And um, yeah, we're, in, we're excited by the fact that God is on the move in that land. But also want to give a sense that God is also up on the move in our own land. And he's moving to win people for himself. And they take, take something of that burden and that encouragement with us today. That is something of my desire today. So we have um, <clears throat> some pictures to show as well. So my, my slide, the focus of the talk has been the fields are ripe for harvest. The fields are ripe for harvest. And having a harvest mentality in Scotland in 2023. Uh, I know that for many of us, having been through a pandemic, um, maybe we we're on our situation where our job is not so secure, or the sense of our income is not so secure, or our family situation is distracting us often, we get distracted by many things. And we wouldn't say, well, my, my mind is on the harvest that God has for this nation. 
And so I want to encourage us. Yes, we have those things in our lives, those things that, um, in a sense, God has given us as a burden to care for and to think about, but he's also given us a burden for sharing the gospel and uh, for praying that his harvest will come in our nation in these days. And so in the midst of this, the Lord spoke to me and said, do you have a heart for my, do you have a harvest mentality for my harvest in your world, around, in the world around you? And um, when we think of mentality, we often, or perspective or reflection, we often think of like a um, survival mentality. <laughs> or we think of bunker mentality. Or we think of um, essential things that are not necessarily in a positive way. But God actually calls us to have um, a harvest mentality, a harvest, the idea that God is actually at work in our nation, he's at work in the people around us, and he's wanting to win the people around us to, to himself. We can also have an abundance mentality. Because of who God is, we have just sang, how great is our God, how powerful, how mighty, all things belong to him, as we say, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So, in a sense, we shouldn't have to think, oh, maybe one day God will save somebody somewhere in Scotland. No, have that sense that, no, God is going to do a major thing, a big thing. And also we are encouraged to have a victory mentality. The idea that we are on the victory side. It doesn't always seem that way, but in fact, we are on that victory side knowing that God is working out his plan. God will take control. Yes, God is in control. He's working out all things beautifully and well in this world um, because he's he's the one who's bringing all things to a complete conclusion at the end of the day. Yeah, into the story, we've actually jumped in, sadly, in this John chapter 4, um, we know the story very well of Jesus, who on his way from Jerusalem up to Galilee, has to arrive or has to pass through Samaria. And as he comes to, to Samaria, he comes to a specific place, Sychar, where there's a very famous well, the well that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And as all the disciples have headed in to buy food, Jesus is alone at the well, and at midday, at the heat of the day, along comes a Samaritan woman to fill her water jar to be able to take it home. And of course, there's this lovely conversation that Jesus has with her. First of all, she's sceptical. Why do you, a Jew and a male, want to talk to me, a Samaritan and a woman? And he said, well, look, if you knew the person who's talking to you, you would ask him for eternal life. And then she adds, well, I want that water. I want that thing that you have for me. He says, go and call your husband. And of course, she, I don't have a husband. And he says, yes, you're right. You've had five husbands down the years. And the person that you're with now is not, you're not even married to. And that kind of explains, of course, why she's coming to the well at midday. Because she is one of the shunned of the society because of this past that she has had. And yet Jesus is willing to go to a despised people, as in the eyes of the Jews, to go to, um, to speak to a woman, but not just any woman, a woman who has had a checkered past and is wanting to share the good news with her. And Jesus, he reveals this to her. She realizes that he's a prophet. She brings up some theological point of view. And Jesus says, well, it doesn't matter. Do you worship here or do you worship in Jerusalem? The time is coming and has now come when all the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter, in a sense, that that time has arrived, that God is looking for those who will worship him in heart. And something in her awakes, and she says, Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain all things to, to us. And Jesus, of course, said, I am he. I am the Christ. And what happens then? She drops her, her um, bowl, her, um, her, her, her basin, and she runs back into town, and she starts to become, she becomes the first evangelist in some ways, 
telling everybody, could this be the Christ? And urging everyone to come out and meet him. And there's a movement that happens. People are starting to leave that town and come towards Jesus Christ. The disciples return and they see him talking to this lady and they don't know what's been happening. Oh, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? No one dared ask Jesus that. But they found it strange. And that so often is reflective of us. They didn't know what was happening spiritually. They hadn't been part of the spiritual conversation. But now they come and things are in motion in that lady's heart. And what Christ has been speaking to them, uh, to her. And yeah, there's that sense that they're coming into the situation, what's that, cold. They don't know what's going on. And I think that reflects how we are in our, in our life situations. We, we sense that God is doing something, but we don't quite know what. And he, we're actually not aware that God is moving in the people around us. And people are searching, they're questing, they're desiring truth. I mean, when we face issues and difficulties as children of God, how much more those people who don't know the compassion, the mercy of God, his greatness, his power. They don't know the relationship that they can have with him. And of course, many people are calling out in our society. There's much mental health problems among the young people, among the adults. There's many situations that people are struggling with. The cost of um, living crisis. Many people are crying out what and how and where. And um, of course they don't have the answers. And into that situation God's spirit is moving and working. And yet we can be aware that God is on the move into people's hearts and lives. So how is God on the move in our society? And sometimes it takes time for us to find out what is actually going on. Listening to people, hearing what is on their heart, the desires that are on their heart. Uh, Talking with them, uh, sharing, uh, probing, asking, um, praying of course. Asking God, look, how are you moving? What is going on? And being in a sort of a process of discernment. Lord, what are you doing? How are you moving? And when we, when we start to think in these ways, we realise that even in our own town, in our own cities, God is doing things in a new way and we have to be ready to respond to it. Well, are we ready to respond to it? Yeah. Um, what gives us energy, what gives us motivation for our spiritual lives? The disciples came back, they said to Jesus, you must be hungry, you must be tired, eat something. And Jesus said, oh, I've had food that you know, you know nothing about. And of course that, well, what's happening? And it's not the first time that Jesus kind of speaks at cross purposes with his disciples Because he's wanting to awaken them to a spiritual truth that they've not been aware of before. And the spiritual truth is that, they say, yes, we can look after our body's needs. But there's another kind of food. The food that comes from knowing and serving God on our our day-to-day lives. And to to, uh, follow after him, to know him, and to, to walk with him. And Jesus also said... My will, what's that? Yeah. My food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. And so the question for us today comes again. You know, what is it that really puts energy in my life? What is it that motivates me? I mean, yes, we have to go out into the workplace. We serve in the workplace. Uh, we make money. We make our living that way. All of these things. But is that is that that which gives us really energy, motivation in our lives? Actually, I think it's often when we know how God is at work and how we can be walking with God in that whole thing and serving in that kind of way. And it's so energising, so encouraging 
when, for example, you've had a, a good spiritual conversation with somebody in the train, in the bus, or at the Friendship Cafe, or wherever. Um, it can be so motivating when you're able to share testimony with somebody from your family, how God has been at work in your life. And you have that sense of, hey, this is exciting. This is satisfying. And God wants us to have that experience again and again. What is our food? What is it that gets our gastric juices flowing, you might say? And I say it's not going out to work and all these things, but being in the place where God wants us to be and being able to share a word for him or to speak for him or to be um, serving him in different kinds of ways. And of course, there are so many opportunities for us to serve God. And it's good to be reflecting, how is he wanting me to do that? Well, I'm not able, Lord. I'm not capable. Well, of course, it doesn't depend on us. It depends on the fact that God is able. Am I available? This is the thing. The picture there is of some incredible star system taken by one of these big telescopes out in space. Yeah. Um, God has created all things. He has the ability to move all things. God is taking control. Um, for me, the question is, well, am I actually available? Am I willing to be used by him? And for him to um, take me up and use me in his service. So now we come to the next words of Jesus, which of course are significant. Um, now is the time of God's spiritual harvest, and the harvest is abundant. Now is the time of God's spiritual harvest, and the harvest is abundant. And you can imagine in your mind's eye, as he's having this conversation with the dis- disciples, here are all these people leaving Sychar town, and they're making their way towards him. And Jesus points to them, and he says, and says, don't say four more months, and then come the harvest. Lift up your eyes. Look, here's the harvest on its way. And here was a sense that he could see the spiritual harvest coming towards him. And that was it, the exciting thing. Yeah, the harvest was there. And so he, he told them, look, don't look for another time. Four more months and then the harvest was probably a, a common expression saying, not now but later. <laughs> you know, we know the normal natural thing of the natural way of things. Um, we sow the seed today and after four months then comes the harvest. And that's the kind of the natural way of things. But Jesus says, don't look for the natural way of things. Look for the supernatural. Don't say it's going to be like that, but sowing the seed and upcoming the, the, the ears come quickly in the spiritual harvest of God. So, no, behold, lift up your eyes. Look to God's ability. Look on the fields. See the harvest is coming towards you. And it's here. It's now. It's ready. Why could he be confident like that? Why? Because of the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was working in that lady's life. She left her water pot and ran into the village to tell people about Jesus. What caused these people to walk towards Jesus? The Holy Spirit, moving in their lives. Curious, desiring, wanting to know more about Christ. What is it that when we speak our testimony or share something of the good news of Christ, people grab it. That's the working of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to encourage you today that God is on the move. He's moving in people's hearts and lives. You know, you remember, I'm quite sure, um, when is he moving? He's right here and right now. Sadly, I didn't have a picture of a large crowd of people in Resaith, but that's a picture of folk in Emberkeething, the hat and ribbon race, and then a saint says, no, God is on the move, right here, right now. And uh, yeah, maybe in the, in the gala time, I'll get my camera out and take a few photos of the crowds. But yeah, God is on the move in Recite as well. Not only in the book, but um, you know, he's he, and right here, right now. Um, and we can be excited by the fact that, yes, the spiritual harvest is on our doorstep. We can be looking for it, not to be neglecting it. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> you might remember the story of William Carey. 
that very first Baptist missionary who was eventually, eventually went to India. And when he presented his plans to the other Baptist ministers, they all shouted him down and said, Be quiet, young man. God is big enough and strong enough. When he wants to save the heathen, he'll do it himself without your help. <laughs> but of course, no, that didn't um, daunt um, William Carey. He realised, yes, God will do his part, but we also have to do our part. What did William Carey used to say? Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. So expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And so, of course, it comes to us. We are also labourers in this harvest. Our involvement is needed and will be rewarded. Even now, the reaper takes out his um, scythe and he's going out to bring in the harvest so that the reaper and the sower together are glad when they see the harvest that comes into reality, comes into being. But every one of us are called and all of, all of us are involved in bringing the harvest. Think of it, some people sow the seed, they kind of share something of their Christian life with a non-Christian Later on, that person hears a story on the radio about a Christian, or they listen into Christian radio. Next thing, somebody gives them a leaflet. They read it. They think, this is something very important. Another time, they visit Friendship Cafe, and they have a good blether with the folks there, and they think, wow, yeah, I need to get right with God. And then, next thing, another person talks to them, and they're giving their life to the Lord. And that's how it works. We are all part of a chain. Sometimes we do the sowing. Sometimes we take away the, the stones. Sometimes we're doing the watering. And sometimes we're doing the reaping. And the wonderful thing is that we are involved in different ways at different times in seeing these things happen. Another story from Egypt. A very zealous uh, American missionary was uh, working in Egypt. He was a, a young man. He learned the language perfectly and every evening he would go down to the, the tea shops and he would be talking to the men in the tea shops and every evening he was talking about the faith, talking about the faith and he says, I don't see much response and he was starting to get discouraged in his life. Oh, why do I keep doing this? Isn't God going to work? Oh, oh I'm, I'm, maybe I should just pack my bags and go home. And at that time, at that point, when he was thinking like that, um, a very wise Egyptian pastor, an Egyptian man, saw him and he said, Now, young Robert, let's just call him Robert, um, now, young Robert, don't be discouraged. Remember the lesson of the sugar cubes? Huh? The lesson of the sugar cubes? Oh, yes. Now, you know, a packet of sugar, a, a packet of sugar cubes. It's not just got one sugar cube in it, does it? It has about uh, 100, 200 sugar cubes in. And when you wanted to put them into place, you have to have to put them one by one into place. And that's what you're doing. Every time you have a conversation with one of these men, you're putting in a sugar cube. And one day, that box will be full and that person comes to Christ. Oh. So in a sense, it's like drip, drip. and <laughs> says sugar cube by sugar cube. To the point that the box is full and the person wants to give their life to Christ. And that met... <clears throat> yeah, that met Robert's needs and he was encouraged and he kept on going. <clears throat> so we, we often also need that kind of encouragement yeah, to keep putting in the sugar cubes. You know, with your family member, with your husband, with your children, with your work colleague with the person you're with, your neighbour, just putting in the sugar cubes to the point that one day God will bring the increase that he's wanting to bring in and through that person's life. Yeah, so as Paul would say, you no, know, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but it's God that makes it to grow. And we have that encouragement that, yes, we do our part. Yeah, um, in a sense, we attempt great things for God, but we also expect great things from God. He does his part. 
Yeah, let me skip. Yeah, let me just mention that very briefly. Um, I was in preparing for the message. I came across this very interesting booklet by the Evangelical Alliance that, in a sense, made a comparison between me, me as a Christian learning how to do evangelism to me as a couch potato learning to do a 5k run. You know, and they sometimes have these apps that are called from couch to 5k and in a sense you, in a sense, you download this, this app and the first week you do some walking and the second week you do some walking plus a bit of running and the third week you do a bit of walking but a bit more running and eventually after many, many months or so, whatever, <laughs> then you're actually now running the 5K. Is that you, Veronica? See you? You're looking a bit um, red there. Is that you learning to do the 5K? Oh, excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, you start off slowly and you build up and you build up until, like me, you can run five kilometres, no problem at all. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but anyway, so... Um, but yeah, this, this booklet made the illustration of we learn to do evangelism by walking first and taking up steps and running. So first of all, we have to learn to get off the couch. We have to be motivated to do it. Then we have to get a bit of simple training and to, in a sense, learn how to talk about Christ. And then as we're moving on into the third stage, we become more skilled and into the fourth stage, when we become, this becomes a very natural thing that we do day by day. So let me encourage you, even if you're like me, you've not got off the couch yet, so let's all get off the couch and be motivated to start sharing about Jesus Christ. Well, of course, what happens? Um, there was an astounding harvest in that God-forsaken place. Now, the Jews, they thought Samaria... It's the worst place of the worst. They're not even proper pagans. They mix um, Judaism with pagan religions, and it's terrible, it's not nice, and it's shocking. And, um, and yeah, surely God isn't at work there. But when those disciples saw what happened, Jesus was invited to stay, and he stayed for two extra days. And as the people heard the message from Jesus' lips, they also believed they even said to the woman, no, we first believed because of what you said, but now we've heard Jesus for ourselves and we really know, and we really understood what Jesus is saying. We have believed for ourselves. And so these disciples, they were gobsmacked, you might say. Oh, my mind, my mind blowing, you might say these days. Well, because of what God was doing in that place. Yeah, and I think it's encouraging for us to know that God will do something astounding in our days in Scotland as we are faithful in serving him and bringing the gospel message to other people. So let's be encouraged to, do, to take that forward. Yeah, as we mentioned in northern Iraq, we were serving. When we first arrived to the city, there were maybe four believers where we were serving. And then as... And since different people were sharing, as also local Christians came on board, um, various churches started developing. And this is the picture from a picnic um, from 2017, I think. And it just shows the fact that there are many people now in these churches' families. Um, this is actually only about a quarter of all the people that were at the picture, at this picnic. That all the ladies and their children were in one place and all the men were off having their picnic somewhere else. Very common kind of thing. But um, yeah, you see that um, God has brought around a wonderful harvest in that city to the point that our own team today say this city is reached. We actually don't need to focus on this city anymore because there's enough happening. There are other places that we need to give our focus on rather than give focus on this city. So let's be encouraged that God will do the same as we pray, as we share, as we go out to help others. And of course, it's all because Jesus is the saviour of the world. In this quotation here, they, these people, these uh, Samaritans, 
He says, we have come to know that he truly is the saviour of the world. And in John's Gospel again and again, it speaks about the fact that he is the saviour of the world. Um, Into John's writings. And of course, across the New Testament, it reminds us again and again that Jesus is the one who has come as saviour of the world. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus is the way that we can be saved. So yeah, Jesus is the saviour of the world. And this, this stirs us, and this in some ways grounds, uh, you see, yeah, it grounds our faith, it grounds our expectation, because Jesus will do it. He will work in people's lives, he will save them, he will bring them around to to a salvation, to knowledge, to knowledge of him. And then to the future, when we think of the eternity, you know, and there's, um, we're around the great throne of God, we're the whole family of God, praising God into eternity. There'll be people in, from Resaith who will say to you and to me, well, I'm here because you invited me. I'm here because you shared the gospel with me. Yeah, Jesus saved me, but you... You are part of that. Thank you for coming and helping me to hear and understand the gospel. So we can be excited, the fact that yeah, Jesus is the saviour of the world. We know that he's not only focusing on Scotland, he's focusing on all the nations of the world. And of course that's what, that was, that's what drives our prayers, not only for our own nation, but for the other nations of the world. That God is at work and he's doing wonderful things. So let's just close. We're going to um, have a few moments for reflection. I've got a few reflection questions coming up. And it's just to reflect, you know, what, is, what does God want to speak to me to about today? So we're going to take two or three minutes just to be quiet, to reflect. Maybe one of these questions is special for you. And just take time to reflect on it in your place where you are. And ask God, well, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, how do you want to change me? What are you saying to me? about this topic. So, here are the questions. Where is Jesus at work today in our Scottish society? And we may not be fully aware of it. Number two, is your passion, your goal in life, to do the Father's will and work? How might this look like in your life? Are your eyes open for the spiritual harvest that God is preparing? Or are you distracted by life or worries or other things Speak to God about this. How are you serving God now in bringing in his spiritual harvest? And what can we as a church do to help one another keep on sharing the good news with the lost? And of course, we as a church, we can be helping each other, encouraging each other to keep on in this goodly process. So let's give it a few moments. I'll close with prayer and then we'll move into communion itself. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for helping us to be in your presence, helping us to hear your word to us afresh. Lord, that you have a spiritual harvest in the world around us. This is ripe for harvest. The fields are ripe for harvest, and we 
ask you, Lord, for the grace to leave behind things that have held us back in the past and the grace to move forward so that we can be faithful in sharing you with the people around us. And we pray, Lord, for a sense of expectation because, Lord, it is you who is at work in our society. Lord, it is you that is at work in the people around us. Lord, you are speaking to them. You are drawing them. Lord, they are desperate. And we, we want to ask you, Lord, to help us to step out, step out of our comfort zone and go to speak to others who are desperately needy of you. And we thank you for the outreaches of the church here. Lord, through the Bloom, through the Friendship Cafe, through every single individual, Lord, who sits to speak of you to other people, who pray fervently for family members, who are sowing, who are clearing away stones, who are watering, Lord, who are reaping. And we want to ask you, Lord, for your harvest to be made manifest, Lord, um, around us. We pray for grace to be part of a chain. Maybe we 